Let's talk about failure. We all do it. Let's just get that out of the way. Some say I've never stopped failing. Like my parents. Sometimes a video just doesn't work out. Especially when you're doing repairs, you never really know if you're going to succeed and every now and then you just don't. At that point I have to decide whether to scrap the video or find some way to make it work even so. Usually I end up scrapping it. But as I've been moving and setting up my new studio, I thought it might actually be interesting to go over some of these old projects and show you some footage you've never seen before. So without further ado, here are my biggest failures. So far. This first one comes from over two years ago. I'd just released two videos repairing an NES and I was hungry for more. I'd gotten this CRT because, well, I like CRTs. And despite the fact that most people would consider this a fairly bland, unremarkable TV, I'd actually grown kind of fond of it. I like the curved black 90s design, it's just endlessly nostalgic for me. I like that it was made by a car company. Yes, I know, Mitsubishi makes a lot more than just cars, including planes and ships. It's hard to describe, but I think I found it plucky, charming, and its own unremarkableness. What I'm saying is it was basically the Dacia Sandero. The only downside was it didn't have any inputs besides RF, but there's a good chance it would have been possible to mod some RGB inputs in, which would have been awesome and a great video to put together too. But right as I was preparing to do that, this happened. The dreaded vertical collapse, where the electron gun no longer moves up and down, just back and forth from one side to the other. People who work with a lot of CRTs have usually seen this at least once. Funnily enough, if you go back and watch part 2 of my NES restoration videos, you can see those vertical issues just starting to creep in. This, I'll be honest, threatened to exceed the two things I knew about repairing CRTs, but nonetheless I plunged forward, hoping to save my new friend. The inside was filthy, packed with dust and cobwebs, and while I did make some efforts to clean it as I worked on it, it remained pretty dirty for the whole time I was doing so. Of course I discharged it, which went well. Luckily it was already discharged, which modern CRTs like this tend to be pretty good with, but you know, it is always good to make sure. The next question was where to start. The truth is I didn't know, so I consulted some CRT experts on the internet. The first thing that was recommended to me was replacing the capacitors, which we all know will either do absolutely nothing or magically fix everything. But it seemed like a perfectly reasonable place to start, so I went ahead and replaced as many caps as I could, of which there were a lot. But this was when I started to notice the board was more than just dirty. Upon closer inspection, it seems to have been caked with what was likely corrosive capacitor juice. Unfortunately, it was hard to even tell where this stuff was coming from because no capacitor seemed to be obviously leaking and it was just all over the place. I cleaned off as much of the gunk as I could with a toothbrush, but I think this would really need to be run through a dishwasher or under a hose to be cleaned properly, which would be something I could do later on. Anyways, I carried on replacing capacitors and got pretty much all of them, but left a few of the bigger ones, which may have been a mistake in retrospect. What I do know is replacing what I did made no difference, so I started looking at other parts of the board. I managed to locate the vertical deflector chip, which for all intents and purposes is the thing most responsible for the up and down movement of the electrons. I found the datasheet for it so I knew what each pin did and checked the voltages. What I found was that the power going to this chip was tiny. I'll let me from two years ago explain further. It, it could be that there are components on this board that need, you know, 0.2 volts or 0.1 volts, but I don't think the vertical IC does, according to the data sheet, um, number pin 5 should be 2.5 volts, and it's not. I traced the power pin for the vertical deflection IC to this transformer? Unfortunately, my lack of analog knowledge failed me here because while I knew this wasn't the flyback, I had no idea what it was. Searching the model number came up with zero results, but I guess it's made by TDK, which somehow means it was made by the same company that published Shrek on the Xbox. But with no documentation and little analog knowledge, it was hard to even tell if this was broken or not. And I never found out. My investigation was tragically cut short by a huge mistake on my part. I was staring at the transformer pins, trying to figure out my next move, when I noticed how corroded the joints had gotten, presumably because of that capacitor fluid. There were many things I could do with this information, but what I did was probably the worst one. Absent-mindedly, I started scraping at it with a screwdriver while it was plugged in. With a spark, a pop, a high-pitched scream from me and a new burn mark on the board, the TV was even more broken. Now it wouldn't turn on at all. 
It's the worst case scenario as someone who does repairs. Not only did I fail to fix it, I made it significantly worse, quite likely permanently. From memory, I tested the transformer and confirmed it was no longer outputting anything. The chances of finding a replacement or substitute for this were low at best. I mean, I couldn't even find a mention on Google, let alone a replacement or documentation. I didn't even know if that would fix the original problem. After all, something was responsible for that capacitor use. I never even figured out what. So because of that, and because I was clearly out of my depth, the video was canned and the TV was never fixed. But it was a lesson I wouldn't forget. High voltage is no joke. And that's what made this failure number one. Okay, so this next one isn't actually a failure, but it is a video that was never released, and you'll see why at the end. Going back to 2019 again, I found these two faulty iMacs for cheap online and thought I'd give repairing them a shot. The first one was a 2008 model whose graphics were so glitched it couldn't even finish booting. Actually, it did manage to once, but only once, and it was chock full of family photos, which is why I'm pixelating it all right now. But you still get to see the palm trees! The second one was completely dead. Legitimately no sign of life whatsoever. It was also a 2009 model, meaning it was a completely different internal design to the other one. I'd actually gone into this assuming I could mix and match parts and get at least one working iMac out of the two faulty ones, but it turns out they're completely incompatible. But you know what, that's fine, because why only have one working iMac when you could have two? I decided to start off disassembling the dead 2009 model, which I fix it labeled as 3 out of 3 difficult. And you know what? They're not wrong. <laughs> this was not the easiest thing in the world. The only way in is through the screen, so you have to use these goofy looking suction cups to lift the glass off, which is held on with magnets. Then you have to get like a hundred other components and wires out. And finally, the logic board itself is tucked into the unibody case, which means to get it out, you have to maneuver it, making sure not to snap any of the alignment pins that hold it in place. Basically, yeah, three out of three difficult, but hey, here it is. And I at least consider myself lucky that it wasn't a newer model when they started gluing the screens together. You know, once upon a time, Apple used to advertise their computers being easy to open. We've also made it easy for our customers to access the insides of the iMac. You just unscrew three screws on the bottom, and then the back comes right off. Yeah, nice one, Phil. I guess that wasn't that important to you after all. Anyways, from here, I was hoping to pull off some Lewis Rossman sorcery, finding whatever was wrong and swapping it out. But I quickly ran into the minor issue of... I had no idea what I was doing with the surface mount stuff. I checked the power supply and the power button to make sure it was all working fine, but after that I was kind of stuck. This is a pretty dense board and it's barely labeled and it has no documentation. So what I ended up doing was just buying a replacement board on eBay. It was only about 50 bucks and if it worked I could sell the whole iMac as working and still just about break even. Indeed, that was it. Just some fault in the logic board. With the replacement it worked perfectly fine. Job done. It can now go on to do iMac things again, like run Windows ME. For the 2008 model, it was a very similar story. The kinds of glitches we were seeing were a telltale sign of a dead GPU, and knowing nothing about GPU repair, I just bought a replacement on eBay. And from that, you might be able to guess why I didn't end up releasing this video. Neither of these are particularly interesting repairs. They did work, but they just weren't the sort of fascinating puzzles that I and I think you guys like seeing on this channel. So I made a video with one of them and eventually just sold them off. The failure here was failing to make a repair worth watching. Our third and final project is a failure, and it's kind of a doozy. It also happens to be another iMac, just a few generations earlier. I've always had a soft spot for these old bulbous G3s. Even before CRTs were cool again, I just really liked how they looked. Throughout my lifetime, I've oscillated between wanting desperately to collect all 13 colors and then selling off everyone I own because I never really have much use for them. Guess which circumstance I bought this one under. Much like the last two iMacs, I saw it cheap online and thought to myself, nice. And I've never had one in this color before, so I had to give it a shot. But there was a reason it was so cheap. This thing was in rough shape. The inner bezel had cracks everywhere, one of the feet was broken so it was all wobbly, and to top it all off, it was completely dead. It wouldn't power on at all. I opened it up to take a look and already bits of bezel were falling out everywhere. I don't think I've ever seen one of these in this bad condition before. Except for maybe smash some stuff's iMac. But it got even worse when I looked at the board. Check this out. I have no idea how that happened. Somehow the RAM got ripped out of its socket and shoved underneath the hard drive? I had to get a better look at this. We're probably about to find out why it doesn't turn on. Well, I guess I'll take out the RAM stick. Jeez. Well, it definitely got there with some force. If you look at it sideways, it's even slightly bent. 
and the socket clearly took some damage as well. I have a pretty strong feeling this thing was dropped or fell off onto the ground at some point. That would explain the cracked plastic on the front as well as everything that happened here. I found even more damage after taking out the logic board. The RAM stick had managed to knock two surface mount components clean off, a capacitor and a crystal oscillator, the latter of which I somehow managed to recover from the numerous pieces that fell out. Assuming I'd have to replace those pieces and wait for them to arrive in the mail, I decided for now to continue disassembling. I had an idea for this inner bezel that I wanted to investigate further, but anyone who's dealt with these iMacs before knows that opening one is a monumental task in itself. I guess IMAX being hard to open isn't such a new phenomenon after all. Eventually, it did pop off, giving us our first unobscured look at the inner bezel damage. Well, it's pretty bad. I did some research about this and found it's apparently an increasingly common problem. With age and probably some damage from UV radiation, this old plastic is just becoming brittle and fragile. A lot more fragile than I expected. Oh, God. <laughs> As far as repairing this, people use everything from epoxies to acetone to try fusing the pieces back together. But what I was thinking of trying wouldn't require any of that. I discovered this 3D printable model of the iMac G3's bezel. Apparently the creator was trying to do an LCD mod and the bezel just shattered in the process, so he made this. The repository also had the brackets he used to mount the LCD monitor, but without them it looked pretty much like a drop-in replacement. I thought, what could be better than a brand new bezel? So I decided to give it a shot. Now, it's important to know at this point that I was under a pretty strict time limit. I was just about to move overseas, and since I obviously couldn't haul this big iMac to another country, I was very much rushing to get it done before I left. I didn't have a 3D printer, in fact I'd never 3D printed anything before, but I did have a friend who was willing to help out. I very much wanted to get the colour right, because while the outer bezel will probably obscure fine details like minor errors in the print, it is still semi-translucent, so the colour of the inner bezel will affect the overall look of the iMac. What you also need to know at this point in time is that my friend lived almost 8 hours away, so coordinating things like colour was a little tricky. Sending him a photo of the bezel could easily be deceiving. We all remember that dress from a few years ago, don't we? It would be easier if I could find the right colour myself, using the bezel as a reference, and then just tell him what to get. But since we were in different cities, there was no guarantee that anything I could find would be available over where he was, and there wasn't enough time to mail anything to him. Printing the pieces was going to take several days, and so would mailing the pieces to me, so in the interest of saving time, I just asked him to print them as quickly as possible with whatever he had on hand, and then I would try painting them the right colour myself once they arrived. Which was probably a mistake, because now I had to figure out how to paint them, and because this 3D printer wasn't big enough to print the whole thing in one go, glue the pieces together, having never done anything like that before, and all under a very strict time limit. Stress level? Zero. Meanwhile, I'd been consulting with a friend who knows even more about these iMacs than I do. He discovered that the capacitor that was knocked off the board wasn't actually necessary for the board to run. This could mean the crystal oscillator is the only thing preventing the board from starting up. It was worth testing out, and rather than wait for a new crystal to arrive, I realised I could bodge the old one back on with wires. Okay, it looks ridiculous and certainly isn't a permanent solution, but it should at least give us an answer. I put in a non-bent stick of RAM into the undamaged socket and powered it on. Much to my amazement... Oh. <laughs> really? Really? Suffice it to say, I was feeling really good about this project now. If the new bezel worked out too, this could make for a complete repair and restoration. And speaking of the new bezel, it was about to become very important. As I removed the old bezel, it just kept breaking more and more, until finally, mere seconds after getting it out, this happened. <laughs> well then, seems like a good time to get back to that new bezel, doesn't it? Our first matter of business was removing these support structures that the 3D printer made. But being new to 3D printing, this was a lot harder than I expected. And even after I got them off, there was a lot of residue left behind. I did some sanding to try and remove the last bits, which I probably would have had to do anyway for the paint to stick. And eventually they were... smoother. They don't look great, but I think they'll be fine after some paint. But I decided it would be best to glue them together first, which was already threatening to be a problem in itself. The creator had left some holes for toothpicks to help with alignment and structural integrity, but the 3D printer had ended up filling a lot of these in, making them basically useless. I tried drilling them out, but I think the drill bit was too thick because after that, the toothpicks were kind of loose, making them not very good for alignment, nor very structurally integritous. But none of that would matter once I realised the biggest mistake that I'd made. 
I had assumed this bezel would be a drop-in replacement, but no one ever actually said that. And with the time constraints, I hadn't asked anyone or made super sure of it myself. Lo and behold, look what happened when I tried screwing one of the pieces in. Now, under normal circumstances, this wouldn't be a showstopper. I'd probably try editing the model myself to extend the screw holes and make it more faithful to the original. I'd probably reprint it in the right color gray and maybe even use a service that could print the whole thing in one piece. But in my circumstance, I'd just run out of time. There was no way I could fit any of that in before I left. And tragically, with the original bezel still in pieces, I couldn't even put it back together. Sadly, this was how I had to leave it behind. My only solace was that at least I could leave it with a friend who was interested in doing the bezel himself. Maybe I'll post an update if he manages to pull it off. I think the takeaway from these projects should be that nobody's perfect, least of all me. Sometimes people ask how I know a lot of this stuff, and oftentimes I'm just learning as I go. Every project teaches me something new that makes me slightly more knowledgeable for the next project, and that especially includes the projects that don't really work out. Anyways, thank you all for watching and for your patience as I've been setting things up here. We'll be all back to normal in the next video, and I hope to see you all then. Bye, guys. Subscribe to